important to realize we all play a children's card game for a living. Most poker players are not top 500 in the world. They're somewhere below <laughs> that. It has to be a passion project. I mean, that's another thing. Don't do it because you think you're going to get rich. Do it because you like it. Since then, I've learned no hoodie, no sunglasses, no headphones, unless there's somebody really annoying at the table. And I can promise you that you can play poker way longer if you're having fun compared to if you're not. Hey, Jonathan. So a pleasure to have you here. And thanks for being uh, on this interview. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to open this by sort of congratulating you on great start of the year. You had some huge scores already. And I just got wondering, most people probably see you as a content creator at this point, not as much as a player, right? How, how would you define yourself? Are you a player or a content creator? Probably a mix of both, but how do you see yourself primarily in that? Yeah, I'm definitely a mix of both at this point. I realized about, gosh, eight or nine years ago that I wanted to have a family and be able to stay home a large amount of the time when the kids were young, because that seemed like a responsible thing to do if you wanted to be a dad. <laughs> Makes sense, So, right? yeah, so I knew I wanted to step away from playing poker full time because I used to play almost all the time and figure out a way to make money from home so I could stay home for many years at a time. And... I decided to ramp up my training site. So I made pokercoaching.com, really put a lot of effort into it. And I've been doing that a lot for like the last seven or eight years. And everything's going well with that, which is good. And the kids are getting a little older. So I've made a point over the last year or so to start going and playing more live poker tournament series, especially ones that allow me to play a lot of buy-ins in a short period of time. Okay. And um, the tournaments at PokerGo are a great example of that, where you can play $10,000 buy-in tournament or bigger every day for 10 or 12 days, which is a good amount of time to be away from home before I need to get back. So <laughs> to recharge yourself a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta be reasonable whenever you have other responsibilities. Right. So sure. I, I, I found that I can get away for about two weeks at a time and everything's okay. Any more than that, it starts to get a little bit rough. So I've been doing that more for the last year or so. And to be fair, I had a lot of like ninth to fifth places in the poker go studio over the last year but then over the last few months we've had three first and some other good runs so it's been a been a pretty good run recently which is good and look there's a lot of variance in poker i mean i realized maybe I, I was running poorly before maybe i'm running hot now whatever that's how it goes but most of my time now is still spent working on pokercoaching.com with roughly two weeks of it out of every month being devoted to playing poker but even then i still work on poker coaching also that's quite a lot if you actually do play two weeks per month. I, I yeah, it's, it's, not that it's been ramping up a little bit more. It was one. Now it's like two. And it's some. It's not like I used to. I, mean, I used to play all day, every day. So it's it's very right. different than what I used to do whenever I was grinding full time. So it sort of was poker player, then content creator, and then coming back to becoming both at this point. Definitely both at this point. But I mean, look, the nice thing about running a poker training site is I get to watch a lot of content and bet a lot of content and learn from a lot of the best poker players in the world. And I've essentially spent the last seven years learning as much as I possibly can from a lot of the best players in the world. And that right. makes it easy for me to stay at least reasonably sharp, despite the fact that I'm not playing and studying myself all the time. I'm getting almost spoon fed a lot of the best content in the world. <laughs> That's from the best true. Players, which is, why which is not to take me. advantage of that, right? Yeah. And, and I do. I mean, I go through a lot of content, both on my site and other people's sites and it's my job to make sure I know how to present high-level concepts in a way that people can understand. Yeah, I guess that's a huge part of you being able to represent all of the, even advanced content in super easy to understand way, like in a conversational manner so that people actually understand it. Because like there are a ton of content, but it's not always so easy to like get any useful, I don't know, any use of it in, in some of the cases. So Yeah, I mean... Presentation is very important. I remember watching poker training videos a long time ago, and even some of them still today. It's really boring watching some people talk about poker, usually in a yeah. very analytical way, a very straightforward way, but not necessarily easy to understand, right? Because they're not speaking to people who are, they, they think they're speaking to the literal best players in the world who understand most of the stuff they're saying. Right. They're not yeah. speaking to recreational players or intermediate players or even pretty good players. And you know that that's a large amount of poker players. Most poker players are not top 500 in the world. They're somewhere below that. And so <laughs> it's- the 500, I like that. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very important to present information in a way that can be consumed by by people. And, and I think we do a very good job of that at Poker Coach. 
Yeah, I would double that. I, I think your content is one of the easiest ones to like digest. Uh, I mean, we are also running uh, a site that reviews the training, uh, other training sites do all sort of strategy articles. And I have seen like pretty much all of the training videos there is like, well, probably not all, but most of them. And even though I played poker myself for like, I know almost a decade professionally, some of these videos are just like impossible to sit through, even though the content is obviously very valuable, but there's literally no way for a normal quote unquote player to, to take any advantage of that. So yeah, I think uh, I like the, the approach you're taking with this, but like going going back a bit, I guess, so was content creation a like deliberate idea or is it just something that just happened while back in the days when you were just playing? Like how, long how time that ago, journey begin it? Yeah, so I used to post a lot on various poker forums and I inevitably got people who liked my content on those poker forums. People would post hands, I'd give my thoughts on it, whether they were right or wrong. Everybody was probably wrong back then, but they liked my content and my replies better than other people. So they would inevitably hire me as a coach. And... Since I played a ton of poker back then, I didn't really do private one-on-one -on -one lessons so much, but if they sent me a question, I, in my spare time, I'd write an article on that mm. topic and send okay. them that article. And eventually I had something like 200 articles on 200 common spots. And next time someone would email me a question, I would just send them the article that I already had made. And that was very convenient because eventually I was approached by DNB Poker to write a poker book. And I realized I already have 400 pages worth of good, concise information that I've already written. So then it was just a matter of filling in a few blanks, putting it together. And that was my first book a long time ago. Um, it's called Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker. We completely revamped it a year or two ago, and um, it's a great book. Anyway, from there, we started a sit-and-go training site, me and a few friends, and we were all very good at sit-and-goes, and we only taught sit-and-goes. Eventually, that game died, so they wanted out of the business. I took it over, and we moved primarily to multi-table tournaments. And now we teach all no limit hold'em and we're branching out into other games at this point at pokercoaching.com as well. Right. The, I, it never really started as like, I'm going to make a poker training site. It's more like people are demanding this of me and it's not that hard for me to do. And if people are not demanding it from, if people are demanding it from me and it's not hard for me to do, I might as well do it, especially if they're willing to pay me for it. But it was not all like super easy in the beginning because I'm not very technical on the website development side of things. Um, whenever I had the multi-table tournament side that I was running kind of by myself, I was losing something like 5,000 bucks a month just paying people to make content. <laughs> but I didn't really care because I was making plenty of money from poker and I viewed it almost like a community service, whatever. I had plenty of money from winning WPT player of the year and whatnot. So it was like, whatever. And I was happy to pay it. But over time, I got better at website stuff and marketing and all of that and found the right people and we ramped it up. Yeah, I mean, you do have an impressive, te impressive team, to say the least. Um, so the story that sounds kind of usual one, right? You'd probably rarely start a business making insane profits from the get-go. So sort of seems natural that you had to invest something. But but I like the idea that it was like not pre-planned business as a go, but literally just followed what you were doing and that evolved into it. But like, just wondering, so at this point in time, you probably have a pretty big team to cover everything. What you do actually do yourself? Not a whole lot. <laughs> oh, that's a good answer. I, I, like I, over, I oversee. <laughs> no, I have a team of maybe 10 people who work on poker coaching, not counting the, the poker coaches themselves. And, you know, they do all sorts of stuff, marketing and website design and app design and curating poker content and managing the coaches, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's a lot to do on a poker site. So at this point, my job is primarily to make a lot of content, primarily a lot of the very public facing stuff like YouTube content. I also make a lot of the very large courses that we put out. We try to make put out at least one very large course per year, like on poker coaching right now, we have a tournament masterclass and a cash game masterclass that are both 40 something hours long each with lots of quizzes. And I know 40 hours sounds like a lot, but it's actually a bunch of 10 minute long videos that are very interactive. And um, we're going to be making them further interactive in the very near future. But um, it's it's interactive and it forces you to learn, right? Whereas a lot of the other training sites, they just present an hour long video and say, here's this video. And then they don't quiz you on it. And then they say, here's another hour long video. And it's yeah. hard to consume that. Um, so I tried to make content in a way that I like to consume content, which is short bite-sized pieces 
And then I want to be tested right after to make sure I understand it because I might not understand it, right? And so I oversee that a lot to make sure that we have good, strong pillar content. We also have an advanced cash game and tournament course we put out recently. And, I, you know, I make sure all the content is good to some extent. We also have a lot of quizzes on the site. I make a decent amount of those. I'm yeah, I don't think anyone comes even close to, to you in regard to the, the quizzes and engagement part, which I also kind of like, because as you say, you can consume unlimited amount of content, but then if you don't actually remember anything the next day, what good it does it make to you, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, I, I, I still make a decent amount of the content, which is fine. That's, that's not so difficult for me to do. Like right now, as soon as we're done, I have to make 17 YouTube videos for the next month. So I'll make 17 YouTube videos Today, over the next two are days. Are you doing seven? Okay. Over two days, you're making 17 videos? Wow. That's I would do them sick. in one day, except for I have, uh, got, I got other, I got other stuff to do today. But wow, to be fair, my team insane. makes it easy for me. They send me the hands. They send me a document about the hands that they want me to review. They'll give a few notes on things that make sh to make sure that I discuss. Okay. And, you know, I'm going to take a ta uh, one or two takes to get it right. But I'll watch the video. I'll watch the poker hand, consider all the thoughts I want to say about the poker hand, and then I'll then I'll make the video. Okay. And do, do you start filming when you're still sleeping or when you're taking a shower? How does that go <laughs> to make 20 videos per day? Like, that, that literally blows my mind. Well, think about it. If each video takes, let's say, 30 minutes, because I've already had a team do a lot of the hard work for me of sure. getting the video, clipping the video, sending me the video, I just have to click download, right? And then they give me a few talking points, and I think about whatever else I want to say. Um, maybe I run a sim on the side or something if I'm not sure what the right play is. And it probably takes 30 minutes to make a 10-minute video. And then I send it to an editor. They take care of all the editing and stuff. So again, that takes a lot of time. Sure, obviously, that um, helps a lot. But but well, throughout the years of experience, I guess you don't need to remake the videos many times. But 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 other than that, yeah, it's still pretty insane. Well, I'll tell you a secret. Saying. I've gotten to where I make the content where instead of making a whole 10-minute video straight through, I will make like one minute at a time. And... Mm. Okay. Then if I screw up a one minute segment, fine, whatever. I go up and re go back and remake the one minute segment. There are still some videos that I will make straight through. Like for example, we have a promotional webinar today going through three things to crush live, crush live multi-table terms. We'll go through three things and that'll be like an hour long video and I'll just go straight through that. But in live videos, people are a little bit more forgiving if you yeah, mess something up, it's not perfect, whatever. And um, I mean, I learned a long time ago, I'd rather have a lot of content that's like 98% right than almost no content that's 100 percent right and <laughs> yeah. i mean you can you can obsess over getting stuff perfect i mean i know some coaches who have come to me they're like yeah i'm going to script out this entire hour-long video i'm like no that's ridiculous it's going to take you forever and you're not going to like it and they're like no i'm going to do it then they try it and they're like oh yeah you're right mm -hmm. and then we figure out ways for them to make content that they can you know, sort of wing to some extent they can just sit down and do it and I think a lot of people do have specific types of content that they are very good at. I mean, I'll give Giraffe Ganger, for example. He's super crusher online. And I'm not going to have him sit down and make any sort of concise course. That's not what he's good at. He's good at sitting down, playing poker, talking about poker on the fly. And he's excellent at that. And he's fun at that and engaging at that. But he's not the guy I would say, please sit down and make a 40-hour long, very structured course. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Whereas uh, we, have, we have other people like Chris Brewer is doing that right now. And he's the guy who's like super analytical and he can make a plan and develop a curriculum and, and make something like that. So it's not to like take away from anyone saying that they can do this or they can't, right? But you have to play into people's strengths. And I try to play into all of my coaches' strengths so that they make the best content they're capable of and also so that they're happy making it. And I talk to some coaches on some sites where like they don't even like the job. They do it because it just pays them and that's it. But look, if my coaches aren't happy and they don't want to be working with me, I don't want to work with them either. I don't want everyone to enjoy the experience. And if they enjoy it and I enjoy it, we're all going to be happy and we'll all be good. Well, I mean, if no one is happy, then it's not really sustainable long-term, right? You can make a video, but it make if it makes you miserable, probably not going to end up coming every day to make another one. So. It's not sustainable. And I can tell when coaches are just like phoning it in because they're they just like, you know, if they need to make money. All poker players realize that making consistent income is valuable without a very inconsistent <laughs> game yeah so so i i get the idea that they, they want a job and this is like one of the main skills they have but you can tell when they're not into it and if they're not into it it's not as good 
Okay. And if it's sense. not as good, I mean, I, I don't want to put out content that's not as good. So I try to let the coaches do whatever they want within reason. I mean, I okay. certainly give them recommendations for things that I would like them to do better or ways to be more engaging, whatever. But at the same I mean, time, but, I realize that people like making different kinds of content. But that's only natural. Like a uh, top poker player could not be very used to making content, right? It's an entirely different thing. So well, it depends on how their brain thinks, right? I mean, some players are super analytical. Some players are not so analytical. Some okay. are very um, structured in their thinking. Some just kind of you know, play by the seat of their pants when they're playing and they figure it out on the fly. And <laughs> that's fine and good, right? And and you, you can win in all sorts of ways at poker, which is cool and interesting. And I like to show all those perspectives. But yeah, most people are not naturally good at making content. And their first few hours is, are usually pretty bad. And whenever I have a new coach to me, like, oh, come to me. First few years. <laughs> yeah, the first few years are pretty bad. I, I usually don't give them that long, but I'll give them a few hours of making junky content and getting oh, feedback. Oh, a few hours is not much, man. <laughs> well, no, I give them good implementable feedback. I mean, okay. something I did um, before I made this uh, free fundamentals course that I have, you can get it at pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. And also the master classes is I hired one of my friends who owns a large college tutoring site that teaches people college textbooks better mm -hmm. than professors do. And he is really good at teaching people anything. And he didn't know how to play poker. So I taught him poker. And then he went through the fundamentals course and the master's classes and critiqued me. Uh, he probably spent, I don't know, 500 hours critiquing my 40 hour piece of content, right? And that helped me really learn what it is to be a good teacher. And now I can take that knowledge and use it with other people. And I'm not as, nearly as harsh as he was. He's like, no, that's a two out of 10, remake it. That's a four <laughs> out of 10, remake it. You know, and, until I got nine, nine or 10 out of 10 on every video, right? Um, but I can help people fix whatever immediate flaws they have. And also it's good to have a team of people working with me who can help people with the technical issues because using some of these recording programs is difficult. You never know if it's going to work right now. You're probably not even recording right now. And <laughs> that would be yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. Ha -ha. We, we'll we'll but, see afterwards if it comes out or not. <laughs> yeah. Well, like you never know. You never know. Right. And having somebody who can sit down and help you is quite valuable. I mean, I know one of my guys in Vegas has gone to people's houses and set them up with recording programs and literally done it for them because it's a huge pain. Yeah. And I, I agree yeah. on that part. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that solves a lot of the initial problems people have. Because again, if like you're a coach and you can't figure out how to work the recording program, that's just a big headache. Yeah, it and, is building. Uh, plus, poker players are pretty lazy to figure out things like that. Yeah. So. so I'll just do it for him, right? Yeah. And makes a lot of sense if that's an option, I guess. We've tried to find ways to make it to where we can take care of the headaches for the coaches within reason. And that certainly wasn't the case for the first few coaches that we had many years yeah, ago. Imagine, like, yeah. They all went through the headaches and we had a lot of problems, but it's, it's getting better and better and better over time. But I really like your idea of like, being someone who can give that feedback. I remember my first video I made like a few years ago, like I'm I'm not actively making any videos, but those were beyond ridiculous. I like literally were making the 10 minute video for three days probably like, and then when it comes out, I can't even listen to it, but I didn't have anyone to give me normal feedback because the feedback then was, yeah, that sucks. You should not post it. Not really a very useful feedback, right? <laughs> so yeah. I, I like the idea of, but it really goes in all of the fields having someone already went through it to help you or who knows something better than you whether it's hiring a poker coach joining a training site or whatever other field it's kind of probably like one of the most plus ev decisions in life you can make where you can actually yeah. learn from someone i'm all for hiring a coach for everything i mean like i hired my friend to teach me how to teach better right i mean right. Yeah, that's even though i had a successful example. poker site i'm still happy to hire the guy pay him a ton of money and it was good right it was it was well worth it i would do it again Right. And it was also very, I guess, scalable in that he went through the fundamentals course and then the tournament master class. And then I extrapolated all that over to the cash game master class, which was just like a not gonna say a clone, but it was cash game oriented where it just like taught you everything you need to know for cash games. And so that was like already done to some extent because I had similar feedback, right? And um, I've had him go through a few other things, but it's valuable, right? Coaching is very, very important. And if you run a coaching site and you're not a professor and you should probably not presume you're the best at coaching. If you are a professor, you probably should not be running a poker site. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> so going back to content creation, like there are many people actually just starting it. It's getting pretty crazy how many guys are creating insanely good videos on YouTube and others just starting 
could not really know how to do it. So maybe you can give some tips for someone new just wanting to get into content creation. Like with all of your knowledge and experience, what would be like easy takeaways that you could give to anyone? I mean, I would first try to figure out what the person's purpose is. I think a lot of people want to be the next big video blogger or they want to be the next poker coach, whatever. But you got to realize that like I got into poker coaching when it was relatively easy because there were not very many competitors. I mean, there was card runners and run at once and that was about it. And I was also fortunate that I already have very good poker results, right? A lot of people who try to get into poker coaching don't have amazing public facing poker results, right? Like maybe they're crushing online cash games, but to be fair, they've only been doing it for two years or maybe they're winning at small stakes tournaments, but like, so are a lot of people, right? Yeah. And I was very fortunate that I was thinking, I think I'm in a spot where it's almost like kind of hard to fail because of when I started, when there wasn't a whole lot of competition and because I had much better results than a lot of other people. And I'm willing to just sit down and do a lot of work. I think a lot of people, well, I'm not gonna say that poker players don't necessarily like to do a lot of work. They don't like to do the sitting down and grinding for no money kind of work mm. when they could be playing poker. And I've always been someone who's happy to do a lot of work up front for free if I think it's going to pay off on the back end. And I mean, I do that all the time with all sorts Ooh. of stuff. I mean, I write articles, for example, for newspapers and magazines, and they pay me $0. And I've been doing it for 15 years. And I think it's going to pay off in the long run. And here we are, we're starting to get to the long run. And it is. I mean, I was just in Vegas and two Uber drivers I had out of like 15 knew who I was from poker. Which is okay. weird, That's pretty right? Nice. I get in the car like, oh my God, Jonathan Little, I love your videos. And cool, good, right? It means we're doing <laughs> it. And I've had people tell me they love my articles in the LA Times or wherever, wherever they're putting them out. And that's good. You're, you're becoming known. And if you become known to all poker players, inevitably, if they decide I want to learn how to play poker, they're going to think of me. And that's something that a lot of people who are just getting into the content creation space do not have. They do not have the last 15 years or whatever it is of people... Yeah slowly learning about them. So their audience is going to be very, very small. Um, so, I mean, look, if you're trying to get started with something, I would tell you, you have to find a way to stand out. You have to be notable, right? Because if you can get other people to talk about you immediately, then you're going to get a lot of attention. I mean, I'll use Rampage, for example. Uh, Rampage Poker makes a lot of content for poker coaching. He has his own super duper popular video blog. And he's done a very good job of making himself notable by getting in there and battling hard in a lot of the biggest stakes cash games, which a lot of people can't do because they don't make a ton of money from other stuff initially. And they also don't have tons of views initially, but he did a good job of gambling a little bit at the poker table, mm. right? I mean, a lot of content creators, if they make, let's say $5,000 a month from YouTube, they take that and they pocket it and they spend it. Whereas Rampage took it and played 25, 50, no limit. And then he won. And then he took it and played 100, 200, no limit. And he won. Yeah, then, his, his story is pretty crazy. I doubt many are repeating that. that. <laughs> yeah, but well, I mean, you could to some extent if you tried. But I, I mean, mean, I'm working right now with this guy named Slick Rick, Eric, uh, Eric Tang. I don't know say his name. Maybe, maybe a secret. I don't think it's a secret. He's been crushing it and he has desires to have a similar trajectory. And right now he's already moving up in tournaments. He's playing higher and higher stakes cash games. I mean, he was playing $1, $3 a year ago. And now he's playing $25.50. Wow, and, that's pretty crazy. you know, I mentor him for about an hour every week. And it's just for fun to try to show people that you can do this type of thing with someone's guidance. And, you know, he's a good poker player. Don't get me wrong. He'd probably be doing fine without me, but he also wants to make content and he wants to play. And I'm trying to push him in the right direction so he can make a lot of money and make good content. But at the same time, the problem is if you're really good at poker, you're not going to make $300 an hour making content anytime soon. So maybe you need to play poker while the games are good and you, have, you can get good action. But on the, the problem hand, a lot of content creators deal with is that it has to be a passion project. I mean, that's another thing. Don't do it because you think you're going to get rich. Do it because you like it. And like whenever I was posting on poker forums a long time ago, giving people advice for free because I liked helping people, I realized I would not be where I am today without the help of a lot of people. And I was happy to help for free. And I'd be happy to send those people those articles a long time ago about specific topics for free. Yeah, that is pretty crazy, actually. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it was it's a community, right? And you help people who want to try to improve themselves. And I realize poker is kind of a competitive game where you may think that these people are going to take my money, but you'll find that the poker space is pretty big, especially in the small and medium stakes. And there's plenty of room to help each other and still have plenty of profitability for everyone. Oh, I mean, not that part. Uh, 
I like the idea of helping uh, and sharing a knowledge. That's really nice. But doing it in the form of writing an article for each question is just so time consuming. So unless you had an initial plan to, to actually use that to publish the book or do whatever, that what I mean is a, a very time consuming approach to solve a simple problem, I guess. Well, so they did not have screen recorders back then. There was no way to video anything mm, okay, on I the mean, internet. Five minute video, yeah. Yeah, there was no way to make a five minute video. That did not exist. You gotta remember, this is in 2003 and 2004. There was no screen recording program. So that was the only way to talk on the internet back in the day. And look, whenever I was moving up in stakes, people would make articles for me, you know, or they would at least reply to my post, right? And some people clearly gave it thought and we made, we became friends. And a lot, a lot of us are still friends today. And I, I was happy to do the same thing for other people. So it was, all, it was reciprocal, you know, like they did it for me, I did it for them. And, and we all improved together. Yeah, that's nice. So as far as these tips go, so I guess don't expect to, to make money from content creation as soon as you start. And when you start making that, just reinvest into the game, I guess that would be the takeaway from this, right? Yeah, I mean, look, if you want to make money from content creation, at the end of the day, you need somebody to pay you, not YouTube. YouTube doesn't pay a whole lot of money. Yeah. So you need to figure out a way to get paid. You made an affiliate site, right? I made a poker training site. Some people run illegal home games. Some people sell t-shirts. I, I like that right? too. <laughs> yeah. You need to figure out a way to make income. Some people get sponsored by a poker site, right? Um, and so you need to figure out how to get paid. And I would recommend everyone ideally make it a way that scales that you have a decent amount of control over. Um, a lot of people, they get locked into a deal with a poker site that doesn't pay them a whole lot of money. Let's say you're a video blogger and, and some site's willing to pay you $2,000 a month and you're thrilled because you're making zero. You got to realize they may just pay you $2,000 a month forever and then cut you whenever you, they decide, you know, get rid of you whenever they decide it's not worth the effort because a lot of the sites, it seems like, are willing to keep pros for a year or two and then they get rid of them because they already captured their users, right? Right. So I would... Try to tell people to figure out ways that you have control over your audience to some extent. And, uh, you know, you, you can find a way that if you do better and better, you can make more and more money from it. Okay, I like that. No, that, that tip is great. Not as easy implementable, maybe. But, but no, having but if control you look at a lot of, of the day is crucial, yeah. If you look at a lot of the people who succeed, they have some sort of business around whatever they're doing. They're not just taking the, the 0.01 cents or whatever YouTube pays you per ad, right? And I mean, it takes a lot of views to get paid a lot of money from YouTube. It takes a ton of views. Yeah. And it's hard to get a ton of views. Like, I, I don't even know how much money I make from YouTube. It's not a lot. And it's because I'm not trying, right? I mean, I run the minimum amount of ads that they require. And that's not the goal. The goal is to help people get good at poker. And if I help people get good at poker, hopefully they will go to my training site and then pay me for the training site. And then we all win. Right. You have to ask what the goal is, right? Again, what is the goal of your channel? I think a lot of people think the goal is to entertain, which which is fine, but then entertain to what end, right? And you got to figure out where you're going. Yeah, you need to have that some sort of unique angle because if you're if you only want to do same thing that everyone is already doing, it's already not a really good start, I guess. Well, look, there's only so much you can do in the poker space. I think. I mean, you can make video blogs for tournaments and or cash games or maybe mixed games or whatever. Um, okay, that's it. People are already doing all that. You can make comedy content. You can make news content. What else is there really? I mean, I don't know. Strategy content, obviously that's what I do. Like what else What else is there? There's not a whole lot. So you have to figure out a way to be better. You gotta be better than everybody else, which is easier said than done. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Everyone's trying to, to get some sort of edge. So these edges seems to get pretty small, same as in, in playing poker, I guess. All edges go down over time in all games. Yeah. And that's that's just how it goes. So let's just say when you started, you, you had like insane edge. You had result, results, right? Uh, and, and that is not something that I'm coming to the same space can even bring at the table. Like there's no way for me to catch up you if I'm starting even at the same time back in the day when there was less competition. I still would not have had a chance to do a training, right? Without winning anything myself and, and getting involved into that. Well, what a lot of people did, I mean, if you look at, um, let's say Card Runners. Card Runners was an old defunct now poker training site back in the day. They had like, I think four founders who were all poker players and two of them, I could be getting this slightly off. Two of them were very good. Two of them were not so known, right? 
And I'm sure the two that were not so known probably did a lot of the back end work. Fine, whatever. And Wait, the two that were known probably did most of the content work, which is fine. And they essentially all got into the training space, right? I mean, whenever I first started making money for my poker training site, it was me and a marketing guy. The marketing guy barely played poker. So he got into the poker training space without really even playing poker. He was just good at marketing. And so you don't have to be good at poker, but realize that you may have to give up part of your business or some of the income or whatever in exchange for that opportunity, right? You're okay, gonna find it. Like, n- none of this is like a solo thing. If you look at any poker training site, it's not run by one person. And if it is, it's probably yeah, not that's not so well possible. This. Yeah, <laughs> at this point. Yeah. If you look at most YouTube channels, they're not run by one person anymore. Like, I mean, I'm telling you, I got people who literally spoon feed me the content to make. I don't look, I don't do any of that myself, right? I don't do any of the editing. I just literally read the document, review the hand, run a sim, make content, pass it off. That's my job, right? And yeah, look, but you I'm need to get to, to that spot. point, right? You you can't start with that. Like if, if a guy, I don't know, just decide to do a video vlog, like he's not going to hire editor, videographer, uh, and someone else. But but I mean, realize that we all start doing it ourselves, right? Whenever I first started playing or starting the training site, it was literally me making all the content and my marketing guy doing all the marketing and website stuff. And that was it. But over time, you realize that if you want to do better, you have to offload some stuff, especially stuff that you're not so good at. I'm bad at video editing, right? No reason I should be doing that. So you offload the stuff that you're especially bad at or that other people could be doing much better at. So, I mean, that's another tip I'd give people is to figure out how to outsource stuff, especially if you're not especially good at it or don't want to be doing it. And yeah, I like, I mean, that like I said, I was well. losing, I was spending slash losing 5,000 bucks a month for like two or three years. And, you know, I realized that's not sustainable for most people, but I was okay with it. I thought it could pay off long-term. And if it failed, whatever, I'm out some money. And thought the, I thought the risk was worth taking. At least, and also, I was doing a community service. It's like, whatever, right? You know, worst case, it helps some people get good at poker and they like you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Some karma points. Yeah, karma points are actually really important. You, you, you'll not, you will not know how valuable karma points are until you start to scale. But once you start to scale, like, everybody likes you to some extent, right? And if everybody generally likes you, I mean, look, everybody doesn't like me. Some people despise me for whatever reason because no one's going to like everybody. But... People are happy to help you. I mean, I've had so many doors open to me in life just because people have liked my content. And that's very valuable. Super duper valuable. I mean, I'll give you an example. I met a guy um, who was an angel investor, very well-known one, who knew me from my content. I knew him from his podcast. And I could I even guess the name, but let's not do it. <laughs> I, yeah, I started investing with him and everything's going great. But uh, since then, I've invested in a few training sites teach people how to dance or work out or play musical instruments, whatever. And I get their company updates because I'm an investor in their company. And, you know, some of them fail, some of them succeed, whatever. But I am getting updates about what is working and not working for other membership training sites, Mm, Okay, which is exactly what I do, right? And most founders of membership training sites kind of are secretive about what's working, what's not working. But if they're contractually obligated to send you a monthly update... (laughs) about how things are going, because that's the deal. If you invest in them, that's good, right? So like, that's just like a little side benefit of me helping the investor. And he was happy to help me let me in, right? And then I get to learn from a lot of other membership training sites that are doing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars a year in revenue, which I'm not doing quite yet. So it's good to be able to learn from all of these other companies. And that, that's just like one, one of a million examples. No, but that's a great point though. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I like it. But I used to sit and play poker with hoodies, sunglasses, headphones. I wouldn't talk to anyone. And I bet I squandered so many good opportunities to make connections. Um, since then, I've learned no hoodie, no sunglasses, no headphones, unless there's somebody really annoying at the table. And uh, I will talk to people and be interactive and engaging. And, you know, certainly some people want to play poker in silence. And so whatever, you don't talk to them. But a lot of people are happy to engage and happy to interact. And if you provide good experiences then people are usually happy to reciprocate. Okay, that makes sense. Like, uh, I really didn't play that part well as well regarding the networking in my initial days, and especially when I was playing poker as well. Like, I was lucky enough to, to like, know the best players in, in my country at that time. We traveled together. But other than that, we did literally, as you said, we played with hoodies, sunglasses, didn't talk. And imagine that we're getting an edge doing that while you might get that initially a little bit, but but 
I agree with your take that in the long run, like these connections and even opportunities that can get past your way is significantly better than additional 1.0.1 big blind or, or whatever. Well, well, that's exactly it. Like imagine playing super stoic does make you an extra 2% ROI in every tournament or something, or, you know, right. whatever, some tiny bit in cash games. It's way less fun to begin with. So there's some happiness yeah. equity there. And I can promise you that you can play poker way longer if you're having fun compared to if you're not. And also you're gonna make friends assuming you're not a jerk right and it's got, you gotta <laughs> get people what you time. do right for some people yeah, it's I mean, better to have headphones uh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> i mean there's this equation in poker where good players winning players are essentially trading an experience for money from the bad players and the bad players are trading their money for a good experience and so it's sort of the good players job quote-unquote job to provide a good experience to the bad players and i think a lot of people don't recognize that. They think it's their job to show up and play perfect poker and crush the bad players. But the bad players will not play if they don't enjoy themselves. And maybe they just enjoy the game. Maybe they're degenerate gamblers, whatever. But I can guarantee you that if people have fun playing with you, you're going to have way more opportunities than if they don't have fun playing with you. Oh, yeah. No, not even touching like the private games that you would never access in your life if you are yeah. just a I get jerk, to play in right? a few amazing private games, no rake, high stakes. Because I'm nice and fun. And, and you know you get for that 10 years for creating nice videos. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff okay. just falls in my lap all the time. It's crazy. Yeah, you you don't do anything. Everything just happens, right? That's well, where, I mean, look, like at the end of the day, right? you, you, do a, you do a lot of work up front and hopefully stuff comes on the back end. I mean, like investing in these angel investment companies. That's something like 80 investments in Startup companies, some fail, some don't. But you already made already 100 investments as an angel investor. Yeah, wow, and, that's uh, a lot. Load the money in, man. <laughs> but <laughs> if I think it's good, I, I'm happy to gamble. But some of them fail, some of them don't. But like some of those people who I invest with, they want to work with me or talk strategy with me, or you know, who knows where those people are going to go? Maybe they're going to be the next gigantic tech founder, and maybe they'll let me in on the ground floor. And if I think it's good, I'm happy to get in. Right? Like you don't know what's going to happen. So sure. keep lots of doors open, have lots of options, plant a lot of seeds, and some of them will hopefully grow. And they're not, you know, maybe they all fail. Who knows? That happens, right? But that's a good takeaway. Being, being, being out there is very important. And I didn't realize that for a very long time. Is this like how you get in in NFTs, let's say? how, how let, Let's touch that point, though, actually, because poker coaching is obviously not the only thing that you're running, right? You're involved. You even have your own NFT collection, so maybe you can for start to share something about that project. Uh, and NFTs can... are tough at the moment. I don't I don't know if people want to talk about that. But I mean, look, I mean, the same guy who helped me, uh, the guy who owned the college tutoring site, he got me into NFTs. He took me to a party in New York with a bunch of people who had these things called CryptoPunks. We're all cool. They're all fun. They're all smart. The next day I went home and bought two CryptoPunks and those did super well. And, you know, again, everything you buy as a quote unquote investment is not going to work out. Some have worked, some have failed. Sure. So still up a decent chunk, but it's just like another thing that could potentially do well. And maybe it'll fail, maybe it won't. Um, I ran my own NFT project. It did really well. I returned a bunch of funds to the people. They made a lot of money, which is good. I don't know. I don't want to go too much into NFTs because who knows what's going to happen with that. Okay, well, but but it's really interesting to, to hear a take on why you're saying it's super tough at this point. It's, it's tough at this point because why is it tough at this point? <laughs> NFTs, uh, people can very easily make an NFT. So the the supply is very, it's very possible to have a ton of supply for a lot of NFTs. Therefore, attention gets spread out among a lot of them. And while the good stuff will inevitably get attention, a lot of the, let's call it second tier stuff, that's good, but still not the top tier stuff, may start to lose attention. And I think my project probably fell in the second tier thing because I'm not devoting my whole life to it. I don't have a gigantic team running it. I just run that for fun by myself as a passion project. And to be fair, we brought in funds. We gave back a lot of funds in various ways to people. And um, you need attention. And I think I've failed to capture a ton of attention in that space. Some but attention, don't get me wrong. goes into waves, right? So it's usual that sure. new projects just show shoves up rather than old ones regaining that much traction except from very few exceptions i guess 
Yeah, I mean, and look, I'm still delivering value to people who have the NFT project. It's called Deck of Degeneracy. People can check it out. You can you can get a physical deck of cards. You have one of the NFTs. Look at this. We have physical decks of cards. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. There you go. Okay. With art by this guy named Wes Henry. Cool art. Anyway. Um, it's a good sign you I have it on your table, though. Yeah, so I give away other NFTs kind of randomly, where if you have, let's say, the King of Clubs, you'll be airdropped a piece of art. And mm, I've okay. given away about 350 pieces of art. I gave away people pieces of my poker action um, over the last year. I gave about something like a million bucks in my winnings over the last year, so, uh, maybe two years or so. So that got returned to people. There's an NFT poker tournament actually happening in Vegas on May 14th. If anybody wants to look into it, they can message me on Twitter. And um, 10 of my holders are going to get to go and play it. So that's just like another perk. We're going to have a party in Vegas. I've thrown two parties in Vegas so far. They're like all day ragers, which is a lot of good. They're like 24 hour parties. And I've thrown one oh, in New man. York City. So <laughs> we've thrown three parties so far for holders of the project. And we have this other impromptu thing happening in May that'll be pretty cool. So I don't know, like- Also, it's not active fun. yet, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not dead. I, oh, okay. I mean, look, <laughs> I, I don't let any, I have this problem where I don't let anything die. Something I would recommend to all content creators is make sure you don't commit yourself to too many things. Because yeah. you may but not be able to But you're doing a lot it. of things at one uh, at the same time, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm I'm really good at not having anything that needs to be done urgently, so that while I have a to do list that's a mile long, I can sit down each morning and figure out what looks like it's good to do today, and then I can do it, and th then I want to do it, right? Kind of like how I let my poker coaching coaches kind of make content like they want within reason. I do whatever I want to do each day within reason. And inevitably, I'm passionate and ready to make that content um, or, or, you know, do whatever it is. And and a lot of the stuff I do, I can do it in batches like YouTube videos, right? I'll just make all of them for a month and two days and be done. <laughs> I love that example, man. <laughs> yeah. You might as well. Oh. Might as well knock them out. I'm well, in YouTube video making mode today. I would like to do it. I'm going to do it, right? right? I'm not in book writing mode today at all. If I had to write a book right now, I would be sick. I don't want to write a book right now. I'm not gonna do that. So have need to have a feel of what you're doing today. Like what's you wake up and feel like today I'm making videos and just go do video? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Simple <laughs> as that. What do I feel like doing today? Simple and, and look, as that. I think it's it's really important <laughs> to get way ahead as well. I think a lot of people work very last minute. Yeah. Kind of like the opposite of a You don't have the option to do it like that. If if you have something that needs to be done tomorrow, it doesn't matter what how you feel when wake up, you still need to do that, right? Right. My, my 20 YouTube videos are quote unquote due by like April 4th or something. So I have mm. four, 14 days or whatever it is to get that done. And I can do it any time between now and the 14 days. And that's going to give the editors plenty of time to do their stuff. Right. Okay. So I, I like working decently far ahead and I, I try to get stuff off my plate. Like I'm not someone who procrastinates at all. Whenever I'm in New York city at home, I'll work from 8 AM till 6 PM pretty straight. I mean, I may go to the gym for an hour and a half or something, but beyond that, I'm, sitting at the desk working on stuff because because it's work time, right? Yeah, well, what, what does it mean for you particularly, how your day-to-day -day looks like when you are not playing yourself? Uh, what does it mean I wake up at 6 a.m. I wake up at 6 a.m., feed the kids breakfast, get them off to school. That's done by 8 o'clock. That takes from 6 a.m. till 8 a.m., roughly. Then from 8 a.m. till 6 p.m., I will sit at the desk and make content. I'll usually go to the gym for like an hour and a half. I've been kind of on a gym kick over the last few months. Kind of got out of shape during COVID, so I had to get back in good shape. And we're getting there. Anyway, um, YouTube video day. So today I spent the first two hours making these like voiceovers for Instagram content, which whatever, you know, took two hours. I knocked out 20 of those. And then uh, here we having, we're having our interview. <laughs> then I have, I'm going to make YouTube videos for like two hours. Um, I spent time downloading everything and reading the documents before this. So everything's like kind of on my mind. And then um, I have a promotional webinar from 5 p.m. till 6 p.m. Then I take care of the kids from 6 p.m. till they go to bed at about 8 p.m. And from 8 p.m. till like 10 p.m., I'll hang out with my wife. And then it's time to go to bed. Wake up okay. and do it all over again. Like pretty standard nine to five job, uh, as you put it. <laughs> eight to six, eight to six. You might as well eight get two extra hours in there. Okay. <laughs> Why work eight hours when you can work 10? Yeah, I, I, I feel the same. Like I usually, my, my schedule is very, very similar. But then after 10 p.m., well, let's say my wife usually goes to sleep. I go to work for two, three more hours because <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't like the idea of working six to eight hours per day. Yeah, you need more. So yeah. I, I found that like once I 
am done for the day, I kind of like to forget about the work. I, I'm pretty good about compartmentalizing stuff. Like this is work time. This is family time. This is sleeping time. And I, I'm open for your tips for that one. You have to be able to just like shut stuff off. I mean, I don't have any good tips beyond recognize that you want to be present at whatever you're doing. Right. And do you like when it's time to hang out with your kids or your significant other or whatever, I try to make that in my mind, the most important thing that I'm doing right now, as opposed to me thinking, all right, I got to do work right now. And certainly sometimes work creeps in there. Like, you know, I mean, half my job is putting out fires at the business, like stuff happens, you know? So I may have to deal with something for a little bit, but usually that's okay. There's a problem. I kick it off to the right person and then they deal with it and done. So I, I try to make whatever I'm doing my main focus and okay. that allows well, me to give attention. Done, I guess. It allows me to give attention to the thing that matters because if you're distracted, people can tell. If I'm distracted, might as well go do the other thing. Yeah, I agree. Like for me, it's super easy to do that. Like when I'm playing with my daughter, like I pretty much never think about the work, but like the, the problem for me is more so when I go to sleep, instead of going to sleep, sometimes I start thinking about it. So, well, so something I do is I send myself a ton of emails. Like if I have a thought pop in my head, I'll send myself an email. I'll look at it tomorrow. I do the same and, thing. That's funny, funny enough. <laughs> well, like with poker hands, whenever I'm playing poker, I, I will write down any relevant hand and forget about it. Cause otherwise I'll sit there and I'll obsess over it for who knows how long. And then I'll, I won't be present playing the next hand. So I, I have lots of things to do on my plate when I show up to the desk in the morning. But, but I do think that's, that's really valuable. just like getting it out of my mind, right? Like, okay, I need, I need to look up this thing, study this thing, whatever. And then I'll do it tomorrow. And I know I'm going to do it tomorrow. So I don't worry about it. Right. I think what happens to a lot of people is they send themselves a to-do item and then they never do it. <laughs> or you send yourself lost. 50 to-do items and then. Yeah, I do them all. I literally clear my earbox, my, my email <laughs> box every morning. And often I'll wake up and I'll have, 300 emails of stuff and 20 of them will be from me and 280 will be random stuff. Like I look at every poker coaching support email. I probably shouldn't still do that, but I still do that. want to make sure nothing's blowing up, you know? Is it um, like a joke or you actually read all support emails? I read all of them. Every single one of them. Wow. Um, okay. <laughs> why, why wouldn't I? It's my company. It's my job. Sure. But if you have I guess I don't trust 300 emails yet. every day, as you say, that sounds like this is pretty much what you do the entire day. <laughs> No, it's quick. It's quick. Usually it's a good testimonial or I want to resubscribe and the button's not working or whatever. Right. There's it's like stuff like, like, and if I don't reply to all of them, I have somebody who replies to all of sure. them, but I read all of them and some of them demand my attention. No, of course it's super valuable for you to understand what's happening. I understand that just joking a little bit, no, but, but also like, I think we have pretty good support at poker coaching. We try to answer everything within 24 hours and we have like 100% money back guarantee. If you don't like anything, just tell me you want a refund. I'll give you a refund. Because if you're not happy and not learning, then I don't want or deserve your money. And I don't know. I like when companies have good support. So provide good support. And I think the boss reading the support emails it helps with that in general. Yeah, I agree with that part. But like, it sounds pretty crazy. How you balance all of this with even finding time to play poker? Like, like well, So I when I go to play poker, I really focus on poker. I don't really, I spend no time with my family. Okay. They don't travel with me. I mean, I'll call them every day, but that's about it. Um, I try to not, I don't make any content when I'm traveling at all, unless I just have to. Mm, okay. So when you go to play poker, you're just there to play. Yeah. And I mean, I'll still okay. deal with the running of the business side of things, but not a lot. I mean, I was just in Vegas for two weeks and I probably spent, I don't know, 10 hours on poker coaching in two weeks, like almost nothing. And that's good. You know, let me focus on poker. And whenever I'm home, I really try to be focusing on, on the business side of things. So again, very compartmentalized. And that, that also helps to keep things fresh. I guess so that I'm not, helps I'm never to clear out. the head a little bit, right? Because then you're working on entirely different things. And so usually said, I get back home and I'm like excited to get back to yeah, that's doing nice. something. So for, for the tournaments and series, you pretty much mostly play tournaments, right? Not, not too much into cash game. Um, I play some private cash games that are usually very good. And mm. most of my time is spent playing tournaments though. Okay. So, because, well, look, the value in tournaments is that they have good publicity, which is good for the training site. Right. So if I do well at tournaments, presumably okay at poker, and if I'm okay at poker, people will want to learn from me. Right. Okay. Always also, thinking about that extra edge. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is why I don't play a whole lot of, call them smaller tournament series or ones that don't have good publicity. 
because nobody even knows, nobody cares. If nobody cares, I'm straight playing for money. And like, what are you gonna make playing any poker tournament today? It's like a hundred bucks an hour or something, unless it's huge. So I could just be sitting at home at my desk making more than that probably. Right. So why would I go play poker and make less money when no one's even gonna care if I do well, or I can sit here and help a lot of people and make more money, like doesn't make sense, right? So I try to play just high value stuff at this point, which is mostly televised stuff. Okay, that's also a nice, nice take, I guess, to to actually know why you're playing what you're playing and not just what, chasing everything. Well, what is the purpose, right? Yeah. And I think a lot of people get really wrapped up in the idea of prestige or clout. And like some people want to win a World Series circuit ring because two of their friends have one and they have none. And the next thing you know, they're playing a whole bunch of $200 tournaments where they're paying $200 a night to stay in a hotel in a random place. And like, what are you doing? You're torching money. You're not in really enjoying yourself. You're probably not going to win because it's hard to win. It's like, what, what are you doing? They want to have a ring because their friend has a ring. I think it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. um, I used to play every World Poker Tour event because only one person had three and I had two and I had a bunch of close calls. So like, presumably I'll get three if I keep playing. But after a while I realized, who cares? What's the purpose? I don't want to fly to a random place to play tournaments that they were starting to make smaller and smaller buy-ins because they used to all be $10,000 tournaments or bigger. And then started making the 5Ks, then 3,500s, then sometimes even smaller. And it's not worth it. I'm not going to chase this potential prestige that no one really cares about so much besides yeah, me. Like, and why do I care about it? Because I think other people care about it, but I know they don't. Therefore, <laughs> Yeah, I think that's overestimated. No one cares too much about others getting trophies. But Yeah, and I mean, look, it's easy for me to say because I have a lot of trophies, right? There's a bunch of trophies there. There's bunch of trophies up there you know we got a bunch of trophies so it's go. easy for me to go about saying i don't care about the trophies so much but i mean you gotta you gotta ask what is the purpose of what i'm doing and if your time is limited you need to play the most high value things whatever that means yeah like i mean you can even argue that in your case the trophy actually matters more than for 99.9 .9 percent of the population because then Definitely. again you you can show that as another thing to attract more more players to your coaching side uh, and back and back and but forth, it depends so. on the trophy, right? If I win a nightly two hundred dollar <laughs> tournament, like sure, you get a trophy, but nobody cares, right? And if you win, well, yeah, that's example. I, was just, example. I was just at the win playing tournaments, and the win has good prestigious tournaments. There's coverage there, but say I do win a random two thousand dollar tournament there, does anybody really care? Yeah, like I, I would venture to say not so much. Um, so what, what the is the next studio, event? Yeah, well, well so what, Poker Go Studio, for example, everything is streamed live. All the final tables are, which is great. They, they put some of them on TV, which is great. I mean, the two I just won, they're going to put on TV, which is valuable because that gets in front of a lot of people who may not know me, right? And like that makes a whole lot of sense to play. So my next trip is back to the Poker Go studio to play essentially a clone of the series I played earlier this year. Where it's Hopefully ending up the to... same way as well, right? Yeah, that'd be good. I mean, <laughs> look, you know how it goes. You know poker. There's a lot of variants. <laughs> but no, I mean, I've, I've had decent results there and a whole lot of relatively close calls and... It's good. I like playing there. I, and my, at least as far as places I've played, it's like the best playing environment. They give you free food. The environment's great. Everyone's nice. Venue's wonderful. It's good. I love playing okay. in Portugal Studios. I, I will come for the free food there. <laughs> there's there's a cheap rake or close to no rake, um, which is if you show up on time, which is super valuable as well. I mean, imagine if you play 10 tournaments and you save $400 a day on rake, that's $4,000 you save. Yeah. Off of a regular tournament series, which is nuts. If you yeah, just show up on time, four thousand dollars for free. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. That's not about it. <laughs> no, I mean it's, it's literally. I mean it's it's a good deal, and they give you free food, so you save fifty dollars on food every day. So that's an extra five hundred bucks. Okay, I like how we think about these sort of tiny edges everywhere. Like it's really... not even tiny. That that's valuable. Well, I mean, imagine you yeah, play four series there a year. Yeah. That's twenty five thousand bucks you save. Yeah off four tournament series that you want to play anyway, that they're going to put you on TV and give you publicity, which is all yeah. what I'm going for. So they're essentially paying me 25K a year to play those over other things. <laughs> okay. Like a no-brainer. Yeah. So other than that, what what are you playing? Like, Poker Go is sort of, explain that one. So World Series, I guess you're going to hit that one this summer? So Poker Go is the main focus. Um, I would love to go play the Triton tournament series, but the scheduling has just not been great for me for a while, which is kind of frustrating. 
but I'm sure some of that will line up at some point because they also do a good job of giving the players very good publicity. I hear they treat players really well. The venues are great. They give you free stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So I would love to play the Triton series at some point. Um, I go to the Bahamas a lot. Usually when they have tournaments in the Bahamas, they tend to have a very good series of a lot of decently high buy-in events in a short period of time. So I went to, I mean, I've gone to like every big series. They, a party poker had one, poker stars had one, and GG slash world series had one. And they are, they're always good. So I like going there. They all stream a lot of the final tables, even though I haven't made any of them. <laughs> so those are good. World Series of Poker is, I would venture to say, not so good because they don't stream a lot of the final tables. And I have zero bracelets. Uh, I guess I'm bad at World Series events. But Need to change I don't that. know. A bracelet's not what it used to be. I mean, it's really not. They give away it tons of them. It is true, yeah. If I wanted a bracelet, I would just sit in Vegas and play online for a year and inevitably win a tournament. You know, it's like it's going to happen if you sit and play online. So I don't know. I don't really care about a bracelet. Sure, it'd be nice to have one, but I'm not going to devote my summer to playing thousand dollar buy-in tournaments to try to win a bracelet one in yeah. six years or one in 10 years or whatever it is that you get and you got to realize if you play every no limit tournament besides the biggest ones you're gonna get a bracelet once every 10 ish years if you're good right, that's, that's an amazing deal <laughs> not if that's the goal right and i mean how much money are you making on a thousand dollar tournament maybe you're making 300 bucks or 500 bucks if you're really good so you make 300 bucks or 500 bucks a day do more than that just making content at home so I'm not sure if I'm going to stay out there all summer or not. I'm still figuring it out. It's a little ways off, depending on how life is going. But I'll play at least some. And okay. the times that I play will be very uh, dependent on which tournaments are doing those time slots, right? I want to be able to play a lot of high buy-in stuff in a short period of time. Okay. And I think there's a chunk in the middle and a chunk in the end that makes sense to go play. So we're probably going to see you there either way at, at some we'll see point. see you there at some point. Yes. At some point, yeah. So since you mentioned online poker, I, I'm interested in your take uh, regarding this. Do you actually like even play online? Not really. Not really. I mean, I'll play when I'm in Vegas some. I'll play when I go out of America some, but it's certainly not my main focus. Online's okay. tough. Everybody's pretty good. Yeah, it's Rates a different high. kind of game, I guess, especially with all of these controversies going right and left lately. Yeah, it, it brings the question how, how that could grow in the US in the future, like even with the complicated licensing stuff, like, yeah. It's They're not mess. making it easy. And yeah, it's a know, mess. It, it, it is a mess. And look, I've played more online poker than almost anyone. So it's not like I'm, I'm bad at online poker or something, or I have poor results. I've done very well at online poker when I played, but I just don't think edges are that big right now, currently. And you are playing against a lot of the best players in the world, especially if you want to play buy-ins $500 and bigger, you're playing against a lot of the best players. So would I rather go play a 10K with some players who are not so good or a $500 tournament, to be fair, more $500 tournaments, but a bunch of $500 tournaments with a tiny edge. And it's like a no-brainer to me if I actually have to get up and travel to go do it. Yeah, that makes sense, I guess. But like when I was in Vegas a few weeks ago, I played a day on World Series online, just, you know, I wasn't doing anything else. Make right. some content like, out of it, right? You're staying in New York, right? So it's not really that you even have where to play. Well, I mean, look, there are the unlicensed, unregulated, illegal sure. sites you can play on from fun, anywhere. Fun but I, don't like to, I don't like to mess with those for all sorts of very logical reasons. Yeah. Um, so, no, I, I don't play online at all when I'm in New York. Okay. And, when, and I have no desire to because I have other stuff to do, right? It goes back to compartmentalizing where yeah, I don't want true. to be spending my Sundays and maybe my Fridays and whatever playing online poker. I have other stuff to be doing. Well, you have some stuff. I, I would agree on that part. <laughs> So when you do play live, let's say, and when you travel, like, well, I guess to sort of answer this, but like your day-to-day -day is pretty much just about poker, right? You're not doing any content, as you said. You're not thinking too much about business. So just living in the moment in all regards. Focus on poker, have fun, try to make connections and hang out with people. That's something I can't do at all when I'm in New York, right? So That's true. hanging oh, out with Oh, hitting a few of these 24-hour parties. Yeah, 24-hour parties, stuff <laughs> like that. I like so, that idea. I, I try to have fun and enjoy myself to some extent because home life is like super regimented and super strict and, you know, travel life is a little bit looser and I think that's fine. You need, you okay. need to enjoy yourself and um, you need to do things that you can't do when you're home. Like, like I said, I can't go out and have dinners with people. I can't have company retreats whenever I'm sitting at home. I, I, I do all that stuff when I'm traveling. Well, you could bring everyone to your place. I could, but you know, they like to play poker. So. Got to go to poker places. 
Okay. And are you still studying yourself? Like other than, as you said, overseeing the content, do you do anything specific to like analyze your game anymore? I mean, I do a decent amount of work with solvers. I, I try to run every, every relevant hand that I want to review or talk about through a solver, you know, try to node lock it, try to figure out what's logical and what's good. Um, that's most of what I do now though, is consume a lot of content by a lot of the best players who are, which is on pokercoaching.com pretty much. Which, at pokercoaching.com. Fortunately, they're happy to work with me, which is very, very valuable. And, um, you know, use the solver a lot. Okay. So yeah, like let, let's talk about poker coaching for a minute, I guess. It is a pretty impressive training platform that is probably the most engaging option from everything that exists, I think, at this point. Um, so if someone decides to join the training site and is just sort of starting with poker, like how would you recommend approach it? Like there's so much content, even taking your site, for example, if someone joins it, like how to optimize the training to actually improve as fast as you can, rather than just watching videos one after another. Yeah, we have a very, very clear learning path for people who are kind of newish to poker or new to our site. We definitely recommend you go to pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals. That's a free crash course. It's three hours long. It'll teach you to beat all your friends and it'll get you up to speed. From there, you can go to pokercoaching.com, sign up for a premium membership, and then go through either the tournament or the cash game masterclass, depending on which game you want to play. And that's a lot of content. Like I said, that's something like 40-ish hours long. And that's almost like a prerequisite to make good use of all of the other stuff on the site because you'll understand how to play poker relatively well. Um, somehow I've got this rap for most of my content being beginner content because they watch popular videos on YouTube that are inevitably beginner content. And they think right. everything on that site is for beginners. But it's not. A lot of it's super duper high level. And you need to learn the basics before you should go through the super high level stuff, right? So, I yeah, course, so that's why the... I asked it, like, as, as you say, someone new jumping into solar is probably like one of the worst ideas, actually, that what, what you could do. Yeah. yeah, it is. And you need to, I mean, look, a lot of my content is designed around teaching you how to implement a solver within reason in a lot of common scenarios. Because if you can figure out the first or second best play in any spot, you're not going to lose much EV compared to the absolute right. best place. If you're like somewhere in the ballpark, you're going to be fine. And I mean, to be fair, this is one of the issues I have with some of the, call them GTO trainers. Well, let's say you get a, a bad score, but you lose like almost no EV, but it's not the absolute best one, but <laughs> right. you lose no money by doing it. And like, okay, you know, don't, don't be so critical here. We're not, we're not trying to pick the one that's done 43% and the one that's done 42% is a bad one, right? Yeah. If, if it's the same EV or almost the same EV. Anyway, getting sidetracked here. We try to teach people how to rule so that they can implement roughly what a solver does in all the common scenarios. So anyway, fundamentals course first, master class second, and then either, and then the advanced course for either tournaments or cash games, depending on what you are playing. And then from there, you can branch out. We have a lot of content on specific topics, like playing the World Series main event in particular, or mindset stuff, or, you know, we have all sorts of content. You can go to pokercoaching.com and check it out. We're always yeah. adding new I'm stuff. I'm actually going to check out your fundamentals part. I didn't even knew you had that one. Funny Free, it'll cost you zero dollars. You already know all of it, but uh, a lot of people may not. But it's interesting to see no, nonetheless. So yeah, I, I'm sure someone listening here might find it useful. Um, yeah. And other than that, like, can you give me like one thing that a new player should avoid? Like the most critical mistake when you're starting out? We can give oh, two though, a... but one sounds more dramatic. That's an impossible question because a lot of poker players approach, approach poker with very different mindsets to begin with. A lot of people think that bluffing is bad and scary, therefore I'm never going to bluff, right? And to tell people you should bluff more would be very bad advice to someone who bluffs too much to begin with, right? Or someone who very rigidly studies solvers. It would be bad to tell them to focus more on solvers, right? Because they're probably already too focused on it. So... You have to give advice to people, individuals, right? Which is which is what we do. We have a Discord forum and study sessions where people get in there every day and interact with our coaches and other very good students where they get individual tailored advice. And if people send me an email, I, I, I like I say, I read them all and either I'll answer them or somebody else will answer them and give you good, actionable advice for you. But um, I mean, I don't know. I think the thing most people do wrong is they think they know how to play poker really well. And uh, we're all working. We're all trying to improve. I get better every day. 
And so do a lot of the other best players. So recognizing that you do not know everything about poker is very, very valuable. Okay. I like that takeaway. So going forward, I'm going to be sending you new emails daily with some questions. Great. Uh, uh, and learning as we go. I like that. I like that. That sounds like a good way to, to wrap this. <laughs> so here we go. We had some wisdom from Jonathan. The easiest part left is just to implement it, right? As easy as it is. Implementing is the hard part at the end of the day. I mean, look, ideas are Obviously. free. Implementation <laughs> is what is by far the most valuable thing. And that is what we teach at pokercoaching.com, how to implement all of the ideas and all the concepts so that you can actually play well consistently over and over and over again. Yeah. Jokes aside, like as as logical and straightforward everything sounds right, the implementation part is the the hard one. And you just need to show up and do do the learning, do the playing, actually think of Yeah, I mean look, in, in the master classes, we have many, many flow charts for like when should you bluff on the river? And it's sort of like a checklist. You go through a checklist of should you bluff or should you not bluff? And then is your hand good to bet big or small? And we have a checklist for this. And if you just run through that every single time you're in a spot on the river with a hand that maybe wants to bluff, maybe not, you'll probably come up with a pretty good answer. And like when to continuation bet and how much. We have flow charts for this that very clearly explain like what type of hand you have, how much of a range advantage do you have, how much do a nut advantage do you have? And we explain how to go about figuring out those things. And you just go through that chart every single decision and you're going to be right way more often than not. And and after some time, you probably won't need the chart because like you understand the different groups of hands, what you're doing in, in one spot yeah. or another. So yeah. After cool. a while, it becomes second nature, right? Which is the goal. But whenever you're first learning, it's all very foreign. And it's important to give people a framework that they can go through every single time they're in a scenario and learn how to come up with roughly the right answer. And that, that's a lot of what the master classes are, just giving people a very solid framework that will find them either the best or second best play in pretty much all scenarios. Okay, I like that. Need to jump to check again the, the master classes, I guess. There you go. <laughs> been, been a while the last time I saw, though. Mm -hmm. um, so thanks, Jonathan. I guess what I want to do is just wrap this with a few fire questions, if you're up for this. So sure. let's go. Uh, first one would be, if you had to choose between playing and, and content creation, which one would you pick? Uh... Given I split my time 50-50 between the two, it's a very <laughs> difficult question. Yes, I, think, I nailed it. <laughs> I, I think I would go with content creation because that gives you even more freedom than playing poker. Okay. I can work as much as I want at content creation. Can't yeah, that's true. Okay. I, uh, I had to process <laughs> it a little bit, you know. <laughs> but yeah. I no, but that. like, so look, anytime you're your own boss doing your own thing, you can do it whenever you want, right? I could, no, I could work at midnight like you if I wanted to. Yeah, but like it's not the same though. I can't play a ten thousand dollar tournament at midnight if I feel like waking up and playing a tournament. Well, yeah, okay, to that degree, yeah. If you're playing like cash games online, then you can sort of play whenever you want. But which but is even a then, not necessarily. Not, you can't necessarily play the most juicy games whenever you want, right? Well, like sure. if you are a live cash game player and your goal is to make as much money as possible, you have to play nights and weekends. Yeah, you have to. And yeah. if you don't, you're losing money, right? That sucks. If you're a tournament yeah. player, you have to show up roughly when the tournaments begin and play until you're done. But then when you're done, you can't play anymore. So your hours are limited. At least yeah. your good hours are limited. And with content creation, your good hours are all over the place to some extent, like whenever you want them to be, which is very valuable. Okay, I like that answer. So going to the second one, do you have any idea how many books you have actually written over the years? They're all back there. All those books I've Give either me a number. or had my Just... hand in. <laughs> Real real books by Jonathan Little are yeah. the number is fifteen. Even oh, though okay. I've I've ghost written a few, I've uh, published a <laughs> bunch, I've had my hands all over a few. It seems don't... that you've written a ton. Like I, I don't know if I have seen more books from anyone, but yeah. <laughs> okay. But you know the number, that's a good sign. There's like I 25 back it. there or something. Yeah, mo it looks more than 50, you know. And what what is the best way to relax after a hard day? I'm pretty good at just going to bed, really. I mean, maybe sit on the couch. I like I like this game, Hearthstone Battlegrounds. That's a nerdy game for children. Uh, I'm good at the children card games, like poker and Hearthstone and Magic the Gathering. So I like doing that for fun. <laughs> children, um, poker, children card games like poker. I like that. It's important to realize we all play a children's card game for a living. 
So, you know, don't, <laughs> don't think we're doing anything special here. Right. But let's not pretend, right? Let's not pretend here. We're playing <laughs> a silly children's game. We're very fortunate. I think a lot of people forget how fortunate they are to play children's games as adults. I guess so. It's a bit more interesting than most of mundane tasks you could do in an office. It's true. Well, yeah, because it's a children's card game. Children have fun. Oh, I can I can double that for sure. So the the most fun I usually have through my days is when I'm playing with my daughter. Because yeah, there you go. Then we just usually getting pretty crazy. <laughs> They're happy and goofing off and enjoying life, you know. Yeah, and, uh, I like I that a lot part. Of... How they always happy, like it's insane. Well, not when they get older, but uh, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> A lot but of, when they uh, reach our of, age, right? Yeah. A lot of people forget, though, that we're very fortunate to be able to play a game and potentially make money. It's a heck of an opportunity, so don't be mad or bitter about it when it goes poorly. Don't squander it. And, um, you know, be happy we have this great spot. Right. So the last question kind of ties to this one. What would you do if poker is gone tomorrow? I would probably ramp up my angel investing and art investing. I have a decent chunk of art, physical and digital. I have a decent amount of angel investments. And I think I have a good eye for both of those things. And I would probably ramp that up. Okay. Waiting for invite to your hedge fund when that goes live. There you go. You're in. <laughs> okay, man. So thanks for having this call. Thanks for a nice conversation. Um, let's see if we actually recorded this one or not. Yeah, good luck. Thanks okay. <laughs> Cheers. Bye-bye.